Give Jesus a hand again. Hallelujah. That's our evangelist, Flavia Barbosa. We just honor her. God bless her. Hallelujah. Don't you all just feel the presence of God? I don't know about you. I feel the fire of God in the room. Hallelujah. Anybody just feel that sweet, sweet presence of God? Ah, these are moments you can't buy, guys. You can't buy these moments. You can't even manufacture these moments. These are things that only the Holy Spirit can do by himself when we create an environment where he can do what he does best, and that is show off. He loves to show off. He loves to love us because we are his children. So, guys, take advantage of the moment. Don't miss your moment, okay? I have the distinct privilege of introducing our next speaker. He is Apostle Joshua Shaw, but his lovely wife, if you can stand up and just show yourself. This is Chelsea, Apostle Chelsea Shaw. We're going to hear her one day. <laughs> oh, she's awesome. But both of them are the founders of Walk After Christ. They have dedicated their lives to the Great Commission to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to all the earth and to equip the saints, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. They have a passion for revival and are known as a couple driven by the love of Jesus with miracles, signs, and wonders. So you're in for a treat. Follow them everywhere they go. And they carry an anointing to activate others in their destiny in Christ, evangelism, and supernatural ministry with lasting fruit. They have been teaching and activating others since 2010 and minister nationally and internationally. They have answered the apostolic call to mobilize the body of Christ to walk after Jesus. Their life's mission is to see a generation rise up who was known who know that they are the sons and daughters of God, a generation that is grounded in the word of God and intimate with the Holy Spirit, carrying the gospel to the nations in love and power. I want you guys to stand to your feet. Give it up. Get ready for Pastor Apostle Joshua Shaw. Jesus. Oh, it is bright up here. <laughs> Lord, Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you, God. You're worthy. You're holy. I ask that you'd speak through me, God, that this would be your word, God. We just honor you. We love you, God. Thank you, Jesus. So I also want to take a minute to honor Apostle Daniel and Heather Adams and all the TSNL family. So whenever we throw events, like we've been going to parks and going to different places, just throwing events for the homeless, inviting people to come and encounter God. And just every time you guys come out, like you guys are fire. Like you guys are family. I love you guys. All right, everybody, just lift your hands for a second, okay? Say, Holy Spirit, have your way in me. Now, Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you'd start touching hearts. Right now, in Jesus' name, that you'd start touching. Just prepare hearts to be ready, God. You gave me a word to release. I pray right now that you release your glory, you release your presence right now. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray right now that you start marking their heart with fire. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Touch him, God. Thank you, Jesus. So, 
So before I knew I was speaking, God woke me up at six in the morning with a word downloaded in my heart for you guys, so <laughs> Jesus. Let's go to Acts chapter three. Verse one, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour to pray. At, at, or at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, there was a certain lame man from his mother's womb who was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, and asked alms for those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go in the temple, asked for alms, and they fixed eyes on him. With John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave him his attention, expecting him to receive something from them. But then Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he grabs him, just picks him up, and all of a sudden the guy's walking. It's amazing that this guy sat at the temple the whole time, so everybody knew who this was. This wasn't a paid actor. This, wasn't a, this was just someone just sitting there. Everybody knows this guy's lame. Everybody knows he's crippled. And all of a sudden, he's running, dancing, and they start preaching the gospel. 3,000 souls get added that day. You know, when God starts moving, I've noticed every single time God starts bringing revival, it also brings controversy. Every time God will start moving, it will flare up the religious spirit. It will flare up people who don't really like what's going on. And by the way, you can never appease a Pharisee. You can't. You could debate them all day. Here's the thing. They could see someone rise from the dead and be like, that's witchcraft. You, you can't debate them. Why? Because pride blocks the spirit. Pride blocks grace. When people are, have a religious spirit or when people are offended, they're in pride. They can't receive See, so what, you know, no difference here. Guess what? God started a move of God on the earth. Pentecost happened, and then you have them raising this lame man in front of the temple. And now, guess what? You have this move started where they're seeing thousands of people, and then the Pharisees get upset about it. So they end up arresting them. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Verse 13, it says... Now, when they saw the boldness, everyone say boldness, boldness, of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Do you know what I love about that passage? They were untrained, uneducated, yet for some reason they're bold. For some reason they have authority that the Pharisees didn't have. When God anoints you, it doesn't matter about your doctorate. When God anoints you, it doesn't matter how much you've studied or how learned you are. It matters. Have you been with Jesus? I love that God's raising up an army of people who've truly been with Jesus. And it says, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they commanded them to go outside, they conferred with one another, saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, a notable murder, miracle has been done among them, and it's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. See, here's something. When you start moving in the power of God and you start seeing God move, the enemy will try to put pressure to try to get you to back off. He'll try to threaten you. He'll try to beat you up. He'll try to do... You know, it's funny because uh, when God called us into supernatural ministry, like, basically God, in 2010, God spoke to me and just said, what if you went all in for me? At that time, I was a believer six years. I was halfway in the world, halfway in God, like where I love Jesus, but I also love my alcohol. I love Jesus, but Call of Duty was, you know? 
And then one day God spoke to me out of nowhere, and he's just, what, what happens if you gave me 100%? What if everything you knew about this Bible you actually lived out? So I took him up on that challenge, and then we actually went through kind of hell, because when you make a commitment to God, you know, it doesn't just automatically get turned into roses, you know? Because why? What you say gets tested. The second you make a commitment in your heart to God, you become a threat. So the enemy sees you, he's like, okay, I'm gonna beat you up, I'm gonna do whatever I can. So I started going through all this persecution or all this uh, tribulation where all of a sudden I got tendinitis, so I lost my truck and loader position at my work. We're going through financial problems. Depression hits me because I don't have alcohol to numb it anymore. But I'm like, God, I committed myself to you. I'm going 100%. See, if you go after something, go all in. If you're going after God, go all in. Hold nothing back. So what ended up happening to me, though, was my wife and I started going to church again. And then I just had this encounter where God actually rebuked me on pride. And then I, after that, I got filled with the fire of God, had my first vision that was just basically, I saw myself in third person and I had angel wings stretched out and a sword in my hand. And, and I'm just standing there in the glory of God. And in this vision, I watched this demon step towards me. And this is like, you know, you have visions like you just see a picture. So we, we start going to church again, and basically I got taken out of my body into this encounter. And it was just like, it was, it was a whole nother level. So I, in this vision, I have a sword in my hand, and I watched this demon step towards me. And I noticed I didn't have to swing the sword. I just stood there in his glory, and as soon as the demon stepped toward me, it stumbled and it fell on the sword. Then after that, I, I heard the audible voice of God saying, I am the Prince of Peace and I'm with you. And then from that point on, every single addiction broke off my life, my craving for alcohol, pornography, all of it just bowed to the name of Jesus. Something happened inside me where it changed me from the inside out and then it was, it was all over from there. I'm all in, I'm going. <laughs> so then we discovered God healed people. And, you know, I, we, how many guys heard of a documentary called Finger of God? Okay, so I, I saw that and I just started crying out to God for hours like, God, if you're moving this way, I have to see this. If you're healing people, I have to see this. And then I watched Finger of God and or then Furious Love and I'm just like, I started just walking up to people, praying for people and like nobody around us was doing this. There's no real example that we had or no people that we can, you guys are so blessed <laughs> have a ministry like this you can follow. But we're just like, God, I don't, we don't know what we're doing, but I just kept going to the street praying for people and nothing was working. And then one day I stumbled across a video uh, from Todd White and I, I prayed. I'm like, God, is this stuff real? Like, is this guy for real? And then God spoke to me. He's like, do you want to do that? And I'm like, well, duh. Like I've been, you know, I've been praying for people. But I'm like, yes, Lord. And then that morning, my wife woke up and she had a messed up back. So I'm like, guinea pig, come on. So I put my hand on her back and I'm like, in Jesus' name, back be healed. And then all of a sudden, she starts cartiering up and feels heat fill her back and she gets healed. And then we go to church right after that. And then. We have a friend who's had a really bad sciatic problem, so we start praying over her, and nothing's happening. Prayed again, nothing's happening. Prayed again, nothing's happening. So I just kind of gave up. I'm like, okay. Then God speaks to my heart, says, but I want to heal her. You pray again. So I'm like, okay, you come here, you come here, you come here. And I actually grabbed a bunch of cessationists as my prayer team. And we went in the back room. I'm like, come on, we're praying. And then all of a sudden, this seven-year-old lady hits the ground, and I'm horrified, but I start laughing. Like, this makes no sense, because all of a sudden, this, this seven-year-old lady just goes, thunk, and I'm like, ha, 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 I'm like, what is going on? This makes no sense, God. She better be healed. She better be healed. This is going to be really bad if she's not. So, so she gets up, and she starts crying. She's healed, and it's, 
So, so after that, it's on because I'm a Walmart door greeter now. Hey, listen, a lot of people want the mic. They want the platform. Start where you're at. Your job's your mission field. Your friendships, your relationships, your family is your mission field. If you can't stop for the person in front of you, how are you going to stop for the multitudes? So I'm at, stuck at the door, and then all of a sudden people start coming in. And I'm like, hey, do you, got, do you got arthritis in your hip? They're like, how'd you know that? Pray for them, they get healed. And then I was seeing like just miracles explode. And then But then God sends us to a, a Bible college. And it's a cessationist Bible college. So they don't believe in any of the stuff that we're doing. And God's like, here, I want to send you here. So we start praying for people on campus. And like, you know, I would actually, I remember one of the classes I'm sitting down and the professor was like, if you hear a voice in your head telling you what to do, like that's called immature Christianity. And then all of a sudden, a voice in my head told me to go to the street and go find a girl. So I just listened, went to the street, found the girl, prayed for her. She gets healed. And I'm like, okay. I told the professor, and he just kind of glared at me. So one of the chapels there, it was really interesting. Have you, you know those mornings that just felt off? Like I woke up, everything was just feeling off that day. And this was, you know, when we first started just seeing super, supernatural ministry at that point. Like, I had demons. I got delivered of demons. But I haven't, like, really seen deliverance done. And during the chapel, this, you know, the, got the worship team strings break. And he's like, man, well, can you guys just pray over each other? And this kid comes up to me and he's like, hey, can you pray for me? I'm, I'm going through this and this and this. And I pray. And all of a sudden, I get a word of knowledge. I hear spirit of rejection. I'm like, okay, and, and Lord, I just rebuke that spirit of rejection. All of a sudden, he growls and swings at me. He swings at everyone else, and I'm sitting there, and, you know, first thought, WWE. I'm all, Whoa, and then I just slam him on the ground. <laughs> and, I, you know, I ha I'm like, have him in a hold and, like, in submission, and he's just growling, like, I hate you, putrid mortals, and he's just screaming like this. All of a sudden, like... A whole place full of hundreds of students, everybody ran out of the building screaming. They had no idea what to do with this. And then all of a sudden, there's people, I, I know they were faking praying in tongues. They're like, quick, what did the charismatics do? Ah, ba, 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 ba. <laughs> so I'm sitting there yelling. I thought yelling meant authority. So I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, get out. And then nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden, all the professors are watching and like, this is a demon. And then all of a sudden, all the other professors run out. They grab the mission, mission professors, come. You're the only ones who sees this stuff. And then this big old debate broke out on campus. Can Christians have demons? And it was in every class, it became the whole topic of the whole university. And what's sad is that kid got kicked out of school instead of getting set free. And that time it bothered me that I didn't have authority to cast that thing out. But here's something that blew my mind that still actually kind of hits my heart is that out of a whole school full of the future pastors of America, the future leaders, the future ministers, the people with doctorates, the people who know this whole book in and out, they could quote any scripture, no one had authority to cast out a little demon. That's a problem we have in the church. See, I really believe that God's been highlighting the ministry of deliverance. Why? Because people need to get free. God's hearts, I just feel God's hearts breaking because guess what? When I needed freedom, I couldn't find it. God had to sovereignly come in and just whap me. Why? Because the church wasn't ready for it. Now let's go back to Acts. Verse, chapter 4, verse 17 says, But so that it spreads no further among the people,
Let us severely threaten them. From now on they speak in no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but think, speak the things which we've seen and heard. And as the, after they further threatened them, they found, or they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people since they glorified God for what had been done. For the man was 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. Listen, fruit speaks louder than words. You stay faithful to God. If God's called you to do something, if God's placed an anointing on your life, I guarantee you're going to have persecution. Jesus did. I guarantee you that some demon's not going to like it and flare up. See, it, it was amazing because at, at that school that we were at, we had so many people against us. It was crazy. We were in married student housing, and we would hear people outside the window talk about us and slander us and saying that we're false and saying we're this. And we're just like, okay, God, I'm just going to be obedient. I'm going to go after you even harder. See, listen, if, if the enemy puts pressure on you or tries to fight what God wants to do, you just go after it even harder. But here's something amazing is fruit speaks louder than words. Like they couldn't really do much to the apostles because the person that got healed, the people that get free speak louder than the people with objections. You know, but when they let them go, you know, I really love Peter, Peter and John's response. You know, what, what they do. They didn't come together and write on their Facebooks, look at these Pharisees, look what they told us, look what they did to us. They got together and they prayed. They got together and actually they're like, okay, God, we just got persecuted for raising a lame man up and preaching your word, so you know what? Give us more. Do more. Listen, when people speak against you, what if you got on your knees instead of fighting them, got on your knees and cried out for more? What if people were like, oh, they don't like deliverance, and you're just like, Lord, we need more. Send us the people that need free. We need more. Acts chapter 4. Verse 29 says, Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they prayed, the place they were assembled together was shaken. And the living water poured on them. Says, when they were assembled, the place that they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled. Everyone say all filled. With the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Here's something interesting. Weren't they already filled with the Spirit? Peter and John didn't miss Pentecost, right? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They, re like they were recognized by the Pharisees. The Pharisees saw them and said... They're speaking with boldness. But when all of a sudden pressure came, they cried out for more and the place were shaken and they were actually filled again and then they were even more bold. Listen. There's always more. That means you can always stay hungry. There's never a place where you're like, I've arrived. And by the way, the hungry get fed. I found a principle in the kingdom of God. God's not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of hunger. He's not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of faith. He looks out for those who are hungry, who are desperate for him, or like, God, I'm all in. And he says, okay, that's someone I could use. That's someone who's about my will, not their own. That's someone who's about my heart, not their own. And that's someone who's hungry enough to steward what I give them. If you're hungry for things to God, there's the key right there. Pray, cry out to him. There's always more. And when persecution comes, when people come against you, pray. You know, I've noticed a pattern in, in our, our lives since 2010. What happens is 
we'll go through a season of amazing miracles, God signs and wonders, and then all of a sudden a crazy tribulation period, a crazy trial period, and then all of a sudden we are stretched beyond measure, and then we cry out to God more, and then all of a sudden breakthrough comes, and then all of a sudden God elevates us even more, does even more, moves even more. God knows what he's doing with you. If God's called you, it's he's responsible for the call. If God's placed an anointing on your life, your job is to be obedient to him and follow after him. He knows what he's doing with you. And by the way, you can only hold on to what you're willing to lay down. If your calling's more important than the caller, you have idolatry. We need to hold everything at his feet. By the way, when we get to heavens, we're, heaven, we're going to cast our crowns down on his feet. Why? Because everything that we have is a grace from him. Even your ability to move in the kingdom of God is grace. But did you know that prayer was answered? The place was shaken, but then you get to Acts chapter 5. Now understand this. Actually, before I go to Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 9, verse 31 says, And the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And they were multiplied. See, a problem I'm noticing in churches today is we have either the fear of the Lord where it's like walking on eggshells with your walk with God. You don't really have peace. You're constantly fearful. Oh, no, I messed up. Oh, no, I sinned. Oh, no, I did this. Oh, no. And you end up, if you go all the way that way and you don't have comfort, you end up outside with signs, preaching against things like this. But we've seen the other spectrum where people are like all about the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It's all about the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Then you read passages that like Anais and Sapphira, then it triggers you and you're like, no, that's the mean God. We, I, we'll just ignore that whole passage is in the Bible and then we'll just like comfort, comfort, love, comfort. Then all of a sudden you get all the way over here where it turns into whatever comforts your flesh and you left the comforter way behind you. See, you have to have both. Why? Because if you have the fear without the comfort, all of a sudden you get all whacked and you don't really know God. But if you have comfort without fear, you get whacked and you start using God as an excuse to live in your flesh. You need both. Now, the fear of the Lord is utterly important. We need to treat God as holy, not as a common thing. We need to treat God as our life, not just to add on to our life. See, the fear of the Lord is like this. We like power, right? If we didn't have power in this room, no one would see me. This thing wouldn't be working. Like, you guys like charging your cell phones, right? We love power. We're like, yay, power. You're not really afraid of power. Like, I'm not afraid of electricity when this is charging. But I definitely don't want to climb up a power line and bite it. I definitely don't want to stick my finger in a light socket even because just why? In the same way, we need to recognize God is endlessly forgiving, endlessly merciful, endlessly loving, but he also spoke this whole world into existence. If he wanted to, he could like Thanos snap and praise God, he's a good God. We have a God who's infinitely powerful. He's not someone to play around with. He's not a big fluffy teddy bear. In fact, Jesus is coming back as a lion. So we need to have the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Spirit to steward what God wants to, how he wants to move. When God starts pouring out revival, these are, the, these are healthy guardrails to walk in. Let's go to, back to Acts chapter 5. It says, But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And they kept back part of the proceeds, and his wife was being aware of it, brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, was the issue that they didn't give the whole amount? No. 
it was theirs. They could have sold the house and said, hey, we give you guys half. The issue was they wanted to be seen in the light and recognized in the light of other people. They, want, they saw how people were selling their houses and how people were getting on the in crowd with the apostles. And the, they're like, yes, we want to be a part of this. We're going to sell our house, but let's just keep back part of the proceeds. Why? Because their heart wasn't for the Lord. Their heart was for position. When God starts moving, do not be opportunist. Why? Because it's for his glory, not yours. It's for his, like his power is to glorify him, not you. The gospel is about God being powerful through man. That'd be an awesome tithe speech. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Acts 5, verse 3, it says, Peter said... And I asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie against the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of your land while it remained? Was it not your own? After you sold it, wasn't it in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart and have lied? You have not lied not to men, but to God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. See, what happened, is, what happened do, you, do you remember Uzzah in the Bible? Like where they're carrying the ark the, the wrong way, uh, way contrary how the Bible said carry the ark? Listen, you can try to carry the glory in a contrary way, and it doesn't turn out good. You touch it wrong, you fall over dead. See, what what basically happened was Ananias and Sapphira walked into the Ark of the Covenant. They walked into the glory of God and kicked the Ark and fell over dead. Why? Because the church, the temple of God is supposed to be a place for, for his glory to dwell. When we gather to places like this, his glory dwells amongst the people. Now, Peter was just crying out for a greater level of glory, and God answered with his glory. He answered with his power. And now... This isn't something you want to play with. Same thing happened to his wife. And then in verse 11, it says, So great fear came upon all the church, upon all those who heard these things. See, what God was doing right there was there is a huge move of God, and there is already that spirit trying to come in, that spirit of selfish ambition, that spirit of selfishness. And God put a stop to it right off the bat. He's like, nope. That's not going to be here. Let's go to James real quick. Jesus, you're worthy, God. Oh, here it is. It's at James chapter 3, verse 14. It says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Bitter envy and self-seeking will see a move of God and cause you to rise up against it or cause you to try to flatter to be a part of it. It says, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. When you have selfish ambition, there are people there, so what's my calling? What's my place? What's that? They're not calling so they could serve the will of the Lord. They're asking that because it gives them their importance. There's a place we have to empty ourselves and say, God, you have all of me. I'm okay scrubbing toilets or I'm okay being seen. doesn't matter. It's all for your glory. See, that's what happened with the Nias and Sapphira, and it didn't really turn out too well for them. But guess what else happened? Let's go to, back to Acts chapter 5, verse 12. It says, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. 
And they were all in one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none the rest dare join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added multitudes of both men and women. So you have the fear of the Lord, but you also have the comfort of the Spirit in place right here, where it says, so they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. So Peter got persecuted, cried out to God for more. God answered him. He got filled with more. And now people are diving for his shadow because the anointing that's on him. People are diving for the hem of Jesus' garment. And now they're diving for his shadow. And then you have Paul later on in Acts 19 where his clothing's just being sent off to go cast out demons. Greater works. See, God is moving. And then this part right here, by the way, this is the verse that actually gave us a conviction once COVID all hit and all that stuff. We just kept going because we started our church on accident. Or it wasn't, it was our accident, it was God's plan. But then all of a sudden, as soon as we became a church, COVID hits, everything shuts down, and we're like, what do we do? And God's like, it's not to the government to decide what's essential. Keep going. And then God gave me this verse. And this is a promise that I really believe that we're going to start seeing this fulfilled. But in Acts 5 verse 16, it says, Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Everyone say all all healed. Meaning, think about this. This is the early church. This was God's idea for the church. In the beginning of the church, the birthplace of it, everyone who came there was healed and everyone who came there was delivered. And God gave me that verse when COVID hit and we saw five people healed from COVID. One guy was on his way to the hospital. He couldn't breathe. And he's just like, and then he calls us and we're like, in Jesus name, be healed. And then all of a sudden he's like, I could breathe. Wait, every symptom just left. I'm going home. Jesus. You know, I really believe that the church is supposed to be a place of refuge where people can come in and find freedom. People can come in and find healing. People can come in and find deliverance. See, right now, there's actually a battle going on with churches. And it's funny because we have churches preaching against us too. But people need freedom. You know, we have one lady in our church that the first time she came to our church, she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm just struggling with a little, little bit of anger and just I'd like prayer for that. And so I start praying and then all of a sudden, as soon as I said spirit of anger, she starts screaming at me, growling at me, and then... She got layers of deliverance. What's amazing is I was tearing up because a couple weeks ago I look over and she's casting out demons out of other people. <laughs> Why? Freed people, free people. Now, now, here, now here's something. That lady went to all these other churches trying to find freedom and the pastors told her, well, Christians can't have demons. It's a mental disorder, just deal with it. And then they would isolate and put, you know, you just, what you do is you put a label on that person and you stay away from that person rather than reaching up and pulling them out. See, in, in 2018, God spoke to me and gave me a word that he's, he's gonna do a move in the church where he's gonna take the outcast, the rejects, the black sheep, the ones that don't fit in, the backsliders, the sinners, the broken, the lost, the, all of them, and guess what? He's gonna draw them in and he's gonna heal them and they're gonna be generals in the next move of God. <laughs> that word now I'm seeing deliverance sets people free. Why? Because you don't get to stay an outcast, you're accepted into, into a family. You don't get to stay a reject. If you've been delivered from a spirit of rejection, you don't get to stay there. Jesus. See, that's worth persecution. Now, here's something amazing is 
when God's, God will start doing a move on the earth and then you will have all the Pharisees rise up against it and persecute against it and so try to control it and they, if they can't control it, they will fight it. But through that persecution, what happens is God purifies your hearts. Through that persecution, God actually prepares you to steward what he wants to pour out. Through that persecution, it, what it does is it's a pattern that I see in the body of Christ and I see all throughout Scripture. God gives a calling and then you, go th you start walking in it, then persecution comes and then you get on your knees and you cry out to God. You start forgiving people who, who hurt you and that's partaking of the suffering of Christ. You start forgiving people, you start letting people go, and you start keeping your heart pure in the middle of trials. By the way, change the word trial to testing. Why? Because guess what? There's a blessing if you endure temptation. There's a blessing if you endure testing. There's a blessing if you endure a tribulation. When you go through tribulation, how you respond in that tribulation means promotion or demotion in the spirit realm. When you go through fire, when you go through hard times, when you go through shaking, guess what? How you respond will change everything. Jesus. That's the only way into new territory. What? I really honor you guys. I honor the TSNL family because you guys have truly pioneered Oh, I'm doing good on time. Come on, Jesus. Now, I know this ministry has greatly impacted us and impacted our church. And what you guys have pioneered is actually bringing deliverance into the mainstream of the church. And I know that you guys have just been through a huge shaking. There's been a lot of crazy Leviathan stuff, a lot of crazy people at each other's throats. So the devil loves to get people so at each other's throats, we're not worried about his throat anymore. <laughs> we're too busy trying to slander our brother or sister that we're not worried about the slanderer anymore. We're partnering with him. By the way, the devil's called the accuser of brethren. We should never take on his ministry. If you're truly concerned, here's how you battle. Facebook is not the place to battle. Listen, Paul was concerned that the Corinthian church was going to law before unbelievers and suing each other. Shouldn't we be concerned that we are going before unbelievers and we're going before the whole entire world showing our dispute and airing our laundry for everyone to see instead of dealing it in the kingdom way like the Bible says? Jesus, you're worthy, God. You know, I... I really believe that God is gonna be doing something incredible. At the beginning of this year, I had a vision of a stream, like this giant river and all these streams starting to flow into it. I believe that God is going to do something where he's gonna restore unity in the church. I have no clue how. But it's gotta be his, unity can only come from his spirit. Unity's not a work of the flesh. Unity is not us trying to get along and pretending like we like each other. Unity is in complete submission to the Holy Spirit and flowing with him. But I really believe that God is actually gonna bring a unity in the body of Christ in a greater way where we're gonna start seeing streams that we never thought would work together flow together. But I also believe that what's coming is gonna be, it's gonna be an increase of glory in the churches. It's going to be communities of believers where, guess what? You, you notice how if you watch TB Joshua or you watch Prophet Lovi the other night, like deliverance opens the door for healing and all these other miracles. And then 
it seems like when you deal with the demons first, everything else gets more clear. See, what God is doing right now on a worldwide scale is he's dealing with the demons in the church. He's cleaning house inside the church. Why? Because he wants a people where his glory can dwell. He wants a people that he could pour out a greater level. And it's been the mercy of God that he's withheld this glory. Why? Because guess what? We would have a lot of Ananias and Sapphira. I also believe God is killing self-promotion, selfish ambition. He's killing all these things that we brought into celebrity Christianity. And he's bringing restoration and healing in the body of Christ in those areas. Jesus, I thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, start, I ask that you just start touching people, God. Thank you, Lord. I thank you that there's an impartation of boldness in this place. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, Jesus. Jesus. You're worthy, God. Lord, I pray right now that you'd start touching hearts with fire. In Jesus' name, I thank you right now. If you're feeling a fire start burning in your chest, would you stand up? Okay. Listen, I have a specific word for you all. I just hear the Lord saying over you, blessed is he who endures temptation. Listen, there is a blessing and there's a crown of life and God actually has a greater level of victory. He has a greater level of grace. When he says, blessed is those who endure, guess what? That doesn't mean, bless you, you sneezed. That means there's a greater level. And I see God actually bringing you in a place where the enemy's trying to poke at you in different areas. And I see God just saying, endure. Keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. And it's like the waves are kind of blowing just like Peter's walking on water. Don't look over at the waves. Keep looking at him. And there's a blessing at the end. Don't look at the problem. Look at the blessing at the end, and that's going to be what pulls you through. Wave at me if that makes sense to you. Okay. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. God, you're worthy. You're holy, God. You're righteous, Lord. All right, everyone stand up. Pray this with me. Say, Jesus. Wait, actually, before I say this, don't, don't play with God. If you're not all in, sit back down. If you're not ready to go all back in, don't play with this thing. Just sit down. Wait it out. Lukewarm gets spit out of the mouth. Pray this. Say, Jesus, have all of me. Use me for your glory. I'm all yours. And I surrender everything. Fill me and empower me to be your witness. Now, Lord, I pray for, I just, I honor for what you're doing in this community, God, and I ask that you'd increase it, God, and that you raise up even more generals out of these people, that you raise up men and women of God who don't know when to quit, that when persecution comes, they rise up even stronger. I thank you and I praise you that the fruit of their life will speak louder than the words that the fruit of their life will testify that you are the one and true living God and that you're with them. God, I thank you, I praise you, I honor you in Jesus' name.
I still got four minutes. I could have some fun with this. God, thank you, Jesus, right now. I pray. I thank you for healing shoulder pain. In Jesus' name, I thank you right now that you're just releasing grace for knees. Someone's knees right now is being healed. I thank you, God, right now. Toes. <laughs> I don't know, I just saw a picture of toes. So, God, I thank you right now in Jesus' name. Toes be healed. I don't know, this, this is kind of an odd one, but chronic bad breath. I'm just going out, just okay, God. I thank you right now in Jesus' name that you'll heal tonsils or heal whatever is causing that in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for somebody's rib is being healed too in Jesus' name. All right, check your body. If you had one of those things, check your body. If you're feeling... If you're feeling it gone, you're feeling no pain in that body, wave at me. There, 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 there. Come on, Jesus. Come on. Lord, I thank you. I praise you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. If, does anyone get migraines? Raise your hand if you get migraines. Norm, like, Father, I thank you right now in Jesus' name. Every spirit afflicting be broken now. I thank you in Jesus' name. All pressure be relieved. No more migraines in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, God. I wave at me if it just lifted. Come on. Jesus. Jesus, you're worthy, God. Okay. All right, love y'all. God bless y'all. Wait. Wow, wasn't that amazing? He just stirred you all up to walk in your, in your identity, didn't he? Let's heal the sick and cast out devils, right? Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Pastor Joshua.